We are in the third week of Lent, in the third week of our worship series, Into the Shadows, allowing the Spirit to show us the parts of ourselves, the parts of the gospel, the parts of the way that we have not seen, that we have shied away from. Friends, hear these words of scripture from the 16th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. And from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. And Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? What can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Will you pray with me? Holy God, we ask that you pour out your spirit upon us. God, give us the grace to have hearts that are good soil so that the seeds you plant in us through your words might grow in faithfulness and bear fruit, fruit that glorifies you, fruit that provides salvation and redemption. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Friends, I know that there are a lot less Christians around than there used to be. Makes the news all the time. But still, when you think about how Jesus started with 12, <clears throat> there are still an awful lot of us Christians, really. And when you start thinking about how many people love Jesus and know Jesus and find the peace and joy and hope that they have in this life from the truth that Jesus is Savior and Jesus loves them and by his grace they will be saved. You think about how many people that is the central truth in their life, how many people around us that's true for, and then you think about all of the people across the face of the earth for whom that's true and across the span of generations, how many people have built their life and found salvation through that claim? It's really an incredible amount of people, all kinds of people of every nation, every ethnicity, every language, every, every occupation, every identity, politicians, musicians, athletes, normal, ordinary people like us. Think about the fact that on every war, practically, that's ever been fought, there were Christians fighting on both sides. You think about all of those systems of oppression and colonization and all of the ways that humans destroy other humans, and there have been Christians on both sides of those systems. Think about Vladimir Putin the other day giving a speech to the Russian people, quoting Jesus, saying, 
We're going into the Ukraine because greater love has no man than this than to lay down his life for his friends. It's easy to see, isn't it? Just the gap in other people's lives. It's just so easy to see the gap between how they live and how Jesus calls us to live. Now, we can't see our own gap. Our neighbors can see it, but we don't talk to them because they're jerks. There's so many of us Christians burning books and burning crosses and burning people and picnicking at lynches, but all the time really believing in Jesus and weeping with relief that he loves us still and so lost in sin. And some of us are lying. Some of us are saying it and not meaning it, just pretending. But I believe the vast majority of people who claim Jesus are as sincere as they know how to be. So what in the world do we make of this huge gap between the people who love Jesus and believe in him, this huge gap in our lives and the life of Jesus? How could so many of us love him and trust him and still have our lives bear such little resemblance to him, still be so deeply in bondage to the sin and brokenness and powers and principalities of this world? We have the spirit of Jesus. The spirit of Jesus is in us. And we use it to say prayers and do some good deeds and heal people. And so few of us use the spirit of Jesus to live like Jesus. So few of us have found the kingdom, even though the kingdom of God is here and now and among us. So few of us have learned how to use these keys to the kingdom that we've been given and how to throw open the doors for others. What do we make of that big gap between who we are and how we live. What do we make of that big gulf between our lives and the humble, healing, enemy-loving, miracle-working, lay down his life, advantage-forsaking, foot-washing, tell the truth to your own people even though they try to throw you off a cliff, sit at a table with the people who are going to betray and deny you and give them bread and say, this is my body broken for you and this is the cup my blood poured out, not to condemn you but to forgive you. And I'm not calling you servants anymore, I'm calling you friends. Why aren't we more like him? Church, I believe it's because there are parts of Christ that we don't know. And we don't know them because we don't want to know them. There is a part of the gospel way that we don't accept because we find it unacceptable. Halfway through the gospel of Matthew, Jesus has come away from the crowds with the 12. And he says to them, who do people say that I am? And they say, you know, everybody's talking about you. Some people say you're John the Baptist. Some people say you're Elijah. Some people say you're Jeremiah. But everybody knows you're something. And everybody's trying to figure out what you mean. And Jesus says, okay, but who do you say that I am? And Peter has this moment. And it happens to all of us sometimes. One of those blinding, brilliant, glory moments when you just know something for sure that there's no way you could know. And he opens his mouth and he is as surprised as anyone to hear what comes out of it, to hear his own voice saying, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And that's an incredible thing to say. And think about it. Peter is the first person to say that. Not Jesus, Peter. You could get stoned for blasphemy for saying that, but Jesus looks on him with delight and says, the Holy Spirit showed that to you and you received it. Blessed are you, Peter. You are the rock and I am going to build my church on you and the gates of hell won't overcome it. And what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and what you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven and you get the keys to the kingdom of God. And... Now that you know that I am the Messiah, now that you know that I am the long-awaited Savior and Redeemer of all of the cosmos, now I can reveal to you how redemption is coming, how the curse is finally broken, how the head of the serpent will be crushed by the heel of the Son of Man. And if you are curious about the gap between our lives and the life of Jesus, 
If you agree that there is a tragic lack of transformation, a tragic lack of salt and light in our churches, then pay attention to what happens next, because I believe that that is the key. Jesus says, yes, you're right. Good that you know and receive that I am the Messiah. The Holy Spirit gave that knowledge to you, but you accepted it. And I believe that the church is right here, most of us. We know who Jesus is. We believe in Jesus. We stake our life on him. We have that Holy Spirit revelation, and we have received it. And then we stop listening as Jesus tries to explain to us how redemption is coming. We stop listening because we think that since we know Jesus is the Christ, we already know everything. We stop listening because we're basking in the glory and glow of being right, of being chosen, of having these glorious promises rest on us. We stop listening because we think that since we know Jesus is the Christ, then we already know how redemption is coming. It works like, look at me being all right and jangling the keys of the kingdom up in here. Everybody line up behind me and be like me. And Jesus is saying, now that you know that I am the Christ, you are ready to begin to learn my way. And here's what you're now ready to receive. And we stop listening because we don't want to hear it. Jesus says, I'm going to Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah, that tracks. And I'm going to suffer many things at the hands of the chief priests and elders and scribes, the religious leaders and authorities of the day. Yeah, yeah, that tracks. Those stupid jerks, they don't know you like we know you. Um, and go on, tell us how you're going to blow them up and kick them out and get them away. And Jesus goes on to say, I am going to be killed and raised again on the third day. And Matthew says that from that on time, Jesus is continuing to explain to them, yes, you know, I'm the Messiah, but now you need to know this. You need to understand God's plan for salvation. You need to know that I am the Messiah. So I know the way to redemption. I am the expert, not you. And they can't hear it. They won't hear it. Because the Son of God can't die. He can't be killed by sinners and ignorant losers. You are the Christ. This can't be the way. This is wrong. Peter even takes them aside and says, hey, this is never going to happen to you, Jesus. I will not allow it. Not to my Lord. Not to my Savior. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Peter, you have the mind of humans. You do not have the mind of Christ. I'm not your Messiah. I am the Lord's. You see that in the same passage, church, you've got to see it. Peter is both the rock upon which God builds the church and the stumbling block who tends to persuade, resist the way of salvation. He's both of those things at the same time. Jesus says, this is the way I will be handed over. I will make myself vulnerable. I will offer up my sacred, sinless body, weak and unprotected to all the powers and principalities of sin and wickedness. And I will be destroyed. My body will be utterly desecrated. Sin will do its worst and it will look like it wins. Evil will actually kill the son of God. And Jesus says, this is the way salvation comes. Righteousness handed over to sin. And we have to understand church. This is not this one thing that happened that one time for some weird reason. And it makes us uncomfortable. So we don't think about it. Salvation comes in this way. This is the way of salvation. Jesus makes himself vulnerable to the power of sin. The word vulnerable means wounded. Jesus humbles himself and allows his flesh to be wounded by the same powers and principalities that live in our hearts, by pride, by fear, by violence, by hate, by contempt, by greed. These are the sins which broke Jesus's flesh, which strangled the breath out of him. And the way of salvation does not go around sin and around weakness and around vulnerability. Salvation comes by going through sin and weakness and vulnerability. Don't you see, church, that we are like Peter? We love Jesus and we love God and we think we know them and we expect salvation to come by destroying sin. We expect the Messiah to show up strong with a mighty arm and reject and punish and eliminate sinners like those people. 
Give them a well-earned taste of their own medicine. Annihilate them all together. And Jesus says, I am the Messiah and here is the way. I go to Jerusalem and I yield myself and I make myself vulnerable to be wounded by the power of evil, wounded unto death. I will pour out my life's blood. And we are so sick and paralyzed with fear that we don't even hear what he says next. And rise again on the third day. Salvation comes when Jesus goes in weakness and makes himself vulnerable to the power of sin. Jesus lets sin do its worst and only then overcomes. So when Jesus is risen by God on the third day, he comes back with wounds. The marks of the power of sin he bears in his body. And those wounds become the places that we see the glory of God. In those wounds filled with glory, we see the beauty of God's mercy. We see that there is a power that is stronger than sin and stronger than death and stronger than violence and stronger than hate a power that prevails and transforms sin and that is the power of God's love that is grace which swallows up sin and death so that even they have to become a part of the story of the goodness of God and that is beautiful theology what does it have to do with us what does it have to do with that terrible gap between our lives and the life of Jesus Friends, we have to understand that the way of Jesus is our way too. And we will only know the fullness of God's grace and resurrection only in our weakness and in our vulnerability. And we can only follow Jesus fully if we are willing to follow him in and with our weaknesses and our vulnerabilities. Now, most of us, we love Jesus And we begin like our brother Peter, and that's a fine place to begin. We begin like Peter, and we are so in love with Jesus because Jesus opens our eyes to something we never believed, dared to believe about ourselves, that we are loved by God, that we are lovable, that we are worthy, that we are gifted, that we have sacred worth, that we are chosen, that we are anointed, that God would rest God's spirit on us. God desires us. God has a plan for us. God is pouring wisdom and talent into us, and it is such good, good, good news, and we are on fire to follow. Jesus and to grow in our goodness and to delight in our giftedness and to do big, beautiful, good things for God. So the whole world will look at us and see the power of God, the goodness of God. We have the keys to the kingdom. And friends, that is true. That is good. And that is true. We have been chosen and we are lovely in the eyes of God. And the spirit of God will reveal to you gifts and talents and goodness and just the beauty of the person you were created to be. And we had no idea all of this was in us. And the spirit will allow us to glorify God by serving and sharing our gifts in beautiful ways. We are called to follow God in our strengths and in our giftedness. And... Not but, and, and this is the part so many of us are missing. And I will testify to you that it is the thing that trips me up personally over and over and over again. And we are called to follow Jesus in our weaknesses and in our vulnerability and in our brokenness and in our ugly places. See, Nicole stood up here right now, and she told you a beautiful story about me. And it's true to the glory of God. But there are other things that are also true. So let me tell you another story about me. A personal example that I hope has the appropriate amount of disclosure. So the Lord has shown me graciously to Glory to God, just how evil and destructive white supremacy and racism have been in our country and in our church and in our faith. And the grace of God, the grace of God alone has given me a holy urgency like Peter. It is in me, but it is not of me to be part of the dismantling and the healing and the overcoming of that twisted lie. 
of white supremacy and the way that it just deals death and divisions and injustices and crushes God's beloved people, black and white, and all races in between. And the Holy Spirit has been so good to me to put me in places and teach me things and show me things and help me understand and to call me here and to call all of you here and to grow this imperfect but beautiful community that bears witness to the way that it will be on God's holy mountain when all people live together in unity, right? It is just so good. And I see the glory of God in all of that. And I love to be seen as one of the good ones. As one of the not all white people. As an ally. Ally. As an anti-racist. And recently, a colleague of mine blessed me with an extraordinary, generous, and precious, and painful gift. His colleagues sat me down and opened their heart to me, made themselves vulnerable to me, and said, hey, you recently said some things publicly about a ministry that I lead, and you made a lot of assumptions, and you made those assumptions as if they were facts, and they weren't, and you were wrong. And you mischaracterized me and my work in a way that was really painful and harmful and destructive. And I need you to know that the way you did that came from believing that you knew better. Believing that you knew. And believing that you had the inherent authority to speak over what you didn't know where you didn't have authority, where you didn't need to speak. And that is white supremacy. And in that moment when you were possessed by white supremacy, but you thought that you were acting to dismantle it and you were exhibiting the very sin that you are trying to overcome. And this colleague said this to me in I mean, in such a generous and gracious, it was such a generous, a generous and gracious and loving thing for this colleague to tell me. And it was so painful to hear and disappointing to hear. And it grieves me truly because it was not okay. And nothing about it is a surprise. I already know that I'm a sinner. I already know that I am weak. I already know that I did not get admitted to the body of Christ on a moral merit scholarship. I am here because I need grace and God is gracious, not because I've earned it. So why am I telling this to you? Because we are called to follow God in our strengths and our goodnesses, but we are also called to follow God in our weaknesses and in our brokenness and in our sin. And as a servant leader, I need to go first. I'm standing up here to say some things about me are good and beautiful and lovely, and some things about me are just broken and ugly and sinful, and both are true. But what we are so sorely tempted to do is publicly give back to God all that is good and beautiful in us. Just put them on the altar for display. But to hold back and deny and bury and ignore what is ugly and weak and broken. And to claim that sin, like real sin, like I know we do this confession thing on every Sunday, but like real sin, that's not a part of me. I'm one of the good ones. And Jesus told Peter, Peter, you don't have it here. Satan has a hold on you what you think you know is holding you back from the revelation that will set you free and Peter couldn't hear it and couldn't hear it and couldn't hear it until after he had rejected and betrayed Jesus and then Jesus showed up to him post-resurrection and fed him breakfast and said come on in now you're ready to feed my sheep Jesus the Christ went to Jerusalem, yielded himself up, made himself woundable to our sin so that we would see both the furious, unbearable, destructive power of our sin and that the glory of God can make even those wounds vehicles of mercy and grace and new life make the wounds of sin places of healing and glory 
Do our strengths and talents glorify God? Yes, but they also glorify us. But when we give to God unashamedly our weaknesses and failures and sin, and when grace fills those places, then there it is God and God alone who is glorified. And redeemed sin is the key that opens up the kingdom of God to sinners and broken people. Our gifts and our talents and our goodness, they are keys to the kingdom for the gifted and the talented and the knowledgeable and the righteous ones. But our yielded, repented, transformed, not by us, but by God, sin, those weaknesses, are the keys that open up the kingdom of God to lost and hopeless sinners like me. And we have got to become a people who offer up to God all of who we are, our beauty and our destructiveness, our righteousness and our sin, and say, glorify your name, God, here in all of it. And if we yield all of it up to God, then the glory of God can be made visible in all of it. And we have got to be a church that is unashamed to celebrate our redeemed. And if we deny that we have sins, if we walk around believing that we have sight when we are blind, if we deny that we have weakness, then we hold that sin back from God. And we don't offer it to Jesus as material to work with. And so we don't allow our brokenness to be redeemed by grace. So it remains broken and untransformed. And that is why the gap between who we are and how we live is so Best because we're holding half of ourselves back. And those broken places remain jagged edges that wound us and separate us. But when we learn to make our weaknesses and vulnerability visible, like Jesus did, Jesus was without sin, but when he made himself vulnerable to the people, then our sin became visible in his flesh. But when we say, well, I'm not vulnerable to sin. I'm strong. I can handle this on my own. I've got this, God. You don't have anything to say to me. Then we are fools. When we truly understand the glory of God on the cross, that it was sin like ours that wounded our Savior, then we accept that we are powerless to heal ourselves, and then we yield our sin to God. And only then can we know the all-consuming beauty and power of the goodness of God that we call grace. And then we see that God reveals God's glory in our sin as well, and we are unashamed to tell that story. But we have to believe that we have it. And we have to stop hiding it from others and from ourselves. We have to be able to hear it when a brother or sister loves us enough to come to us and make themselves vulnerable and say, I need your, I need you to accept my forgiveness. I want to close with an image that I hope can help you understand. Many of you are familiar with it. It's this Japanese art form custom. It's called kintsugi. Kintsugi. I practiced saying that so many times. Kintsugi. In Japan, when a valuable piece of pottery is broken, they do not throw it away. They take it to a kintsugi master, and she repairs it by joining the broken pieces back together again and filling in the gaps with gold. So the broken places become the most beautiful and the broken bowls become more beautiful than the ones that are whole. And it is like that with us, church. We can hide our broken pieces. We can hold back our sin. We can deny that we have been dented and wounded and broken by, by sin. Or we can take those shards to the Lord and ask him to make visible repairs in us so that people will look on our lives and see the beauty and the glory of God in the cracks and in the gaps. And our lives will bear witness, not to the goodness of us, but to the goodness of God that shines most gloriously in our weaknesses.